Joining me right now is Florida Senator, member of the Foreign Relations Committee, the Select Intelligence Committee, Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee, and Appropriations Committee, Marco Rubio. Senator, it's great to talk with you again. Thanks so much for joining me. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I should also say thanks for all that you did with this stimulus package. I know you were on the phone morning, noon, and night with businesses big and small. What do you say to those people who say, look, we can't have shutdowns in parts of the country. We have to have a shutdown of the entire country. There's no precedence here for, you know, no economic activity whatsoever. How do you see things today? Well, I think the most important thing we're trying to do is buy time, right? Every day that goes by that people are not going out there and infecting 10 other people or acquiring it from someone is one more day we have to build up capacity in our hospitals. The key here is to make sure that a lot of people don't get sick at once. Until we develop a vaccine, uh, there's no way to prevent this and uh, from medicinally. And obviously, we still don't have antiviral treatments. But that's what we're buying time for, develop antiviral treatments, build up hospital capacity, and flatten the pace of infection. And that does take a little bit of what we're seeing now. Ultimately, what we are doing today is not something you can do for a year or for nine months. I mean, it's not a sustainable thing long term. But it is important that we do it over the next few weeks, as the president has outlined, because it buys us time to build capacity and slows down that rate of infection so we don't have uh, uh, collapses of the healthcare care system in, in different pockets of the country. So where are we on the health care system right now? I know that's another area that you've uh, delved into quite a bit. You know, when I was talking with some people in New York, we're going to speak with Ken Langone in a little while. He's the chairman of NYU Medical. Um, I'd I, I like to know if our hospitals are on the, on the point of, of breaking. Governor Cuomo is making this desperate plea to get more nurses and doctors. What do you think about where our hospitals are right now? Well, as you know, we're a big country. We're a diverse country. So I think that depends where you're asking. I don't know the details of I've been on the ground in New York City. I can only go off what the media is reporting and what local officials are saying. Uh, but I'm sure they're facing a difficult challenge right now, uh, no, no matter how one may want to characterize it. I've seen you know, just reporting on some of the interviews with doctors. I can tell you here in Florida, for example, where I am today in South Florida, I spoke to the head of the largest public hospital last night. Uh, they're they're only at 40 percent, 50 percent capacity. The hospital is empty, and they've done so deliberately in anticipation of a spike, a potential spike in infections. If that doesn't happen, then you know, no, no it, it'd be great news. But uh, so I think it depends on what part of the country we're talking about. But that's an example of why you know this social distancing for a short period of time has been important because it's allowed that hospital to empty out those beds and, and cancel the elective services and, and have the capacity to handle some unexpected event. So I, I don't think it's fair to say our and, hospitals, and, as some people like to say, it depends where you're talking about, which part of the country. Okay. And, and, and in your part of the country, Florida, you've got so many retirement communities. We're so worried about those retirement communities because we know that the elderly are very, are very vulnerable to this disease. Anything you can say about that? Well, the governor here uh, a few weeks ago made the decision to basically lock them down, in essence, not allowing visitors to go into the AL assisted living facilities, to go into nursing homes. And that was an important move. We've had some cases here. We've had some cases in some nursing homes. We have not yet, thank God, had anything like what we've seen in Washington state. We've had tragic deaths in, in two or three cases in some in different uh, nursing homes, but we haven't had that outbreak. And yeah. that's always been my biggest fear. We have a very large elderly population that congregates in, in retirement communities in many cases. And for there to be an outbreak in one of those that uh, would be catastrophic. Thank God that has not happened yet. Me meanwhile, we continue to investigate the origins of this coronavirus. The CDC was not allowed to go into China uh, in an effective way to actually get to the severity of it. Now we've got reports out that say that China's death toll has hit 3,300 but not everybody's buying the numbers out of China. Some say it could be astronomically higher. You and I spoke about this Sunday morning futures last week. And I also yesterday had on the show Heyman Capital Management founder and chief investment officer Kyle Bass. He says the information out of China cannot be trusted. Listen to this. I got to get your reaction. We all know that the Chinese government lies, cheats, and steals its way through the world. And it's important to note that, you know, look, China, as you know, how many people are there? 1.3 billion people. If anyone believes that their infection and death toll is what they published, uh, you know, there's people who I've got a bridge to sell them in Arizona. Uh, it's, it's crazy to me for anyone to think that China is being uh, truthful in any of their communication. 
So, so Senator, what do you say about that? And I guess the broader question of a partnership going forward with China is also worth reviewing, given the fact that in the middle of this crisis, we see an article by Beijing state-run media that says, well, maybe Beijing will hold back on prescription drugs, the prescription drugs and the active ingredients that America needs so dearly right now. Well, I think the interview you just posted is absolutely right. The Chinese have never been honest. The Chinese Communist Party lies constantly about all sorts of things. Uh, you know, they have in, in the they have the, uh, the the camp, the work camp, where they have all the Uyghur Muslims interned, over a million people. You can see the images. It's been well documented. And they keep saying those are vocational schools. As far as the death toll is concerned, uh, it is. We don't know what the number is. I actually think they don't know what the number is. But I think it is, it is most certainly substantially higher than the number they have publicly disclosed, both on the infection rate and on the death rate. It is my view, based on information I've seen from open sources and other places, that there were hundreds, if not thousands, of deaths early in this crisis that they didn't even report as, as COVID-19 deaths. They saw someone who died. They, they, did, they just sort of buried them like you normally would. It took them weeks to even publicly acknowledge that this was a disease that could be transmitted from person to person. By the way, this is not a competition yeah. to see who can have more people die, who can have more people infected. But let there be no doubt, the failure of the Chinese Communist Party to be transparent and to open up to the world and disclose this early has cost the lives of, of people around the world, has cost the infections of people around the world, and has caused this to spread faster and further than it needed to. Unbelievable. What a tragedy. Meanwhile, we know that relief is on the way for millions of Americans awaiting those direct deposits amid the fallout of the COVID-19. Uh, stimulus checks expected to hit bank accounts mid-April, but Speaker Pelosi says more help is needed. She says a potential phase four package should include spending on infrastructure. She floated the rollback of the salt cap deductions as well. What's your take on a fourth package? Do you want to see a fourth relief package? I think, I think there's going to be a fourth package at some point in the future, a recovery uh, package, but I think we have to get through this first. Obviously, there's always the prospect that this goes longer than any of us anticipated, and we would go in and replenish, for example, the assistance to small business that's in the bill. As far as the things that uh, you just mentioned to me that Speaker Pelosi's talking about, I mean, we need, to, we need to get through this first before we talk about all these new legislative agendas. And then... Um, and then sort of take stock to see, you know, wh what is it that our country needs to get stronger at, where it needs to recover. As an example, okay, I, I think that there is no way moving forward that we cannot have stronger supply chains in this country, a stronger domestic capacity to produce things that are in our national security interests, in our public health interests, in our economic interests. That has to be a part of future legislation. But I think right now that's a bridge we will cross. But right now we're at a different bridge. The bridge we're at right now is bringing this infection under control, winning this battle, and getting society open and everyone back to work. That, that's the battle we're focused on right now. So, but, but you've been working on legislation for a while now on, on making sure that uh, we, we lessen our reliance on foreign actors, in particular China. Is that going to be one of the, for lack of a better word, accountability, uh, where China will be accountable for what has taken place? You just said it, it, because they downplayed it, because of the lies coming out of China, more people died. Certainly one outgrowth of this is going to be the fact that companies across America are going to recognize they can't, they, they, they can't uh, you know, depend on China. And cheap stuff yeah. may not be the answer here. You know, I, I wouldn't call it accountability. I would say it's something we need to do anyway, irrespective. You cannot be a country that relies on all of your basic products to be made abroad or the elements of your products to be made abroad. You know, the perfect example are the, these medical ventilators. We can make them in the United States, but the component pieces that our largest makers relied on came from China or somewhere else. And so we've got to have the ability to mm -hmm. do that here. The thing is this, I'm a strong believer in capitalism. I, a free enterprise is the greatest economic system in the world. And the great thing about capitalism is it will always move capital to its most efficient place. It's always going to give you the most efficient outcome. But every now and then, the most efficient outcome is not in our national interest. So it is probably cheaper uh -huh. to make all these important things in China. Yeah. But some of these important things, we have to be able to make them. And I think this crisis has revealed that.
Exactly. Okay, so the Defense Protection Act, the president has spoken about this a lot. I want to ask you about that, and I also want to ask you about the USMCA and whether that's going to be delayed. But Nancy Pelosi, apparently, this this morning on another network, is saying that the president needs to trigger the Defense Protection Act immediately to get more health care products to where they need to go. Uh, what has the president done? Where do you expect the uh, Defense Protection Act to, to go? And will that unleash more products to health care professionals? First of all, the Defense Protection Act is a law that gives the government the power to go to private industry and, and force them into producing things the country needs for war. And I think that's an option. But here's the thing. Most of these companies are already doing it voluntarily. And so why would you put in place a law to force companies to do what they are already doing voluntarily? I think that has a traumatic impact on our society. I think that... I think that's something that, that you have to be cognizant, uh, cautious about implementing. And I think it's something that's difficult to reverse once you do it. I, it's, it continues to be my belief that if someone is willing to step up and yeah. do something voluntarily, you don't have to put a hammer over their head to do it. Now, we're beginning to see more and more yeah. private industry. I want to tell you, one of the most uh, uplifting parts of this entire episode has been how Americans, not just not government, Americans, I'm talking about everyday individuals, those healthcare workers, those doctors, those nurses, uh, the, the, the people who are in a grocery store, you know, who every single day are going I in and opening you. up and potentially exposing themselves, and private industry have gone above and beyond to yeah. try to help the country move forward. And I think that that yeah. is great that despite all the issues we have in our politics, our people are strong. You're right. And the American people have followed the guidelines really well, too. Real quick on this bipartisan group of 19 senators urging the administration to push back the June 1st start date for the uh, NAFTA revision, USMCA, to relieve pressure on companies struggling over the coronavirus outbreak. Should he be doing that? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I probably have to look into that a little bit deeper. And, and I, my sense of it is we've already got so much uh, going on. I'm not sure we want to add one more piece of uncertainty by, by holding back this important deal. On the other hand, it might be necessary to do. I don't mean to be evasive. I don't have a well-informed answer yeah. for you on that topic yet because I, I want to hear both sides of it. I understand the argument that um, these companies are already struggling to begin with, and how are you going to go out now and begin to exercise compliance uh, given all the other challenges that we already face? This, this is not business as usual. Many yeah. of these businesses that would be forced into this deal now uh, are shut down. They're not even operating. So there might be some merit to that argument. And um, it's something I'll, I'll have to look at closer. I'll be frank. I've been focused on small I business the last two weeks, and I've, I'm focused on that issue. I know you are. And the small business community, I know, thanks you. You've been on the phone talking to small and business and and, uh, and big businesses on, on in terms of their cash flow and how much cash they're sitting on. Senator, it's good to see you this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you.